And without further ado, I will inter have our guest speaker tonight, Anna Booker, come up. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. And thank you to the Whatcom County Historical Society for inviting me to give this talk. Thanks also to Whatcom Museum for hosting this lecture series. It's wonderful and hopeful to see the doors to this museum open again after almost a year. Um, I teach history at Whatcom Community College. I've been teaching there for 17 years, almost as long as I have lived in Bellingham. I moved here with my family in 2003, so yes, I'm one of those transplants, but I know uh, that's true for many of you who are watching. So um, first, I just want to say how incredibly grateful I am to be involved in a project that allows me to learn alongside my, uh, my students about this place, the Salish Sea, that we call home. And I want to acknowledge that the building I'm standing on is in the traditional territory of the Lakhtamish or the Lummi people, meaning people of the sea, and the Nooksack people who have lived and cared for our shared land and waterways since time immemorial. Uh, I'm going to turn on my clicker. Okay. One year. Uh, ago today, the corona out, uh, coronavirus outbreak was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. Uh, Whatcom Community College, like colleges around the country, closed its doors. And the next day, I started what would be the first of 365 days and counting of teaching remotely. This was also just one month into the launch of a grant we had received to develop an experiential play-based program at the college in collaboration with the Salish Sea Institute at Western. As project director, I was faced with a choice. Do I stop the program? Do I defer and wait for things to return to normal? I did not waver. The answer for me was clear. No, onwards, we'll adapt. There was too much momentum and honestly, who would believe it would continue for a year? Standing here tonight is a little surreal. I'm in a green room with an audience of one, but a virtual audience of many. I'm allowing myself to grieve what we have lost, and at the same time, I'm grateful for what we have continued to build in the midst of so much loss. I went back and forth about how to structure this talk because I really wanted it to be interactive, but when I talked to my tech guru, that would be Drew Watley. Thank you, Drew, he's in the other room. He explained that there is a delay in the YouTube live stream. So instead of a dialogue, I will limit my talk to 45 minutes, and that will give us time for question and answer at the end. Um, Drew will open up the chat box towards the very end of my talk, and while Wes is wrapping up and explaining the next uh, talk, I'll do my best to look through questions, if there are questions. Um, and then I can answer those before the end of the hour. Okay, so I'm going to attempt to do three things tonight. First, I'm going to situate us in the Salish Sea. Then I'll share what we have done today. And then I'll give a sneak peek at what we're planning for the coming year. Okay, so in, in the online class, we start with an exercise that has students placing pins on a Google map to orient themselves in the Salish Sea. And so in an attempt to do something similar, I'm gonna start us off with a three minute Google Earth video for the Lightcatcher building. And um, this is with my primitive Google Earth skills. So here we go. Drew is gonna start that video. Okay, so it's called the Light Catcher Building because of the 180-foot translucent wall 
that was designed to capture the Pacific Northwest's most cherished resource, sunlight. Here we are at the main entrance to the building. This is where I entered tonight. We're just a couple of blocks from Whatcom Creek. Whatcom, Whatcom is an onomatopoeia. Whatcom from the Nooksack language meaning noising waters or falling waters. This natural rocky outcrop of Chuckanut Suns sandstone created the falling water that attracted the Lummi to the area to harvest the salmon. And it's also what brought the first white settlers who heard about a waterfall on Bellingham Bay to power a sawmill. So you're looking at that Georgia Pacific plant there. That was the former pulp and paper mill. And as most of you know, Bellingham was a mill town for most of the 20th century. And we're now in the process of redeveloping that site with maritime industries, housing, and commercial properties. Bellingham is located in Whatcom County, uh, same name as the creek that runs through town. We've got a large, wide county that extends north to the Canadian border, west to the bay, and east to the Cascade Mountains. My colleagues use the term white caps to white caps to describe the Salish Sea, and I love that description because it captures the mountains, rivers, lakes, and salt water that make up the Salish Sea. Um, when we first moved here, people would talk about Bellingham on North Puget Sound, but look at where Bellingham is. We are closer to the Strait of Georgia and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, and before I even show you that, I just wanted to show you the Fraser River here because it's the largest river that drains to the Salish Sea and it contributes about 75% of all the fresh water that flows into the Inland Sea. When we're talking about the Salish Sea, we're referring to the inland sea that includes the Strait of Georgia, Puget Sound, and the Juan, and Juan, uh, Strait of Juan de Fuca. And you can see here, Strait of Georgia, it, there's not a starting and an ending place with Puget Sound. It's one ecosystem. So if you're, if you're north in the Strait of Georgia, it's, it gets more into the fjords. And then last here, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is where the Salish Sea meets the Pacific Ocean. Okay, great. Nice transition, Drew, very good. So, wow, I'm impressed. So the Salish Sea um, directly acknowledges the Coast Salish. And what you're looking at here is a map uh, of the Northwest and, and, and specifically the extent of the Salish language. Um, there are names and words, as, as most everyone knows, in numerous indigenous languages and dialects for places and phenomena that describe both the coast and the Strait Salish people's human environment relationships and responsibilities. So when we look at the extent here of the, of the Salishian language family, it, it started out actually over, if you can see there, in Montana, and then um, the related Salish languages, thus, as, the, as you're moving west, thus Coast Salish. And I, I bring this up here because the credit for renaming this inland sea goes largely to the Coast Salish gathering and the tribes in Washington state and the First Nations in British Columbia who recognized that it was crucial for government agencies, tribes, and First Nations to work together to protect the health of this inland sea, which is also, as I said, fundamental to Coast Salish cultures. I also want to highlight here another aspect of the renaming as we're situating ourselves in this Salish Sea. And here I'm going to defer to Bert Weber. Uh, Bert Weber, I'm going to change the slide in a second here, is the Professor Emeritus of Marine Biology at Western Washington University. And in this little clip here, he's going to explain um, his initial hope and vision for renaming this inland sea as a response to the discovery of crude oil in Alaska in the 1970s. The name I think has its roots uh, in the oil transportation uh, uh, industry. When oil was discovered in Alaska and was going to come into the inland waters of, uh, this, of what is now the Salish Sea, people recognized and started to look at 
what was at stake? What would we lose if there was an oil spill? And it became clear as that kind of science was done that there was an ecosystem. And that was the ecosystem that uh, said, yes, this is a entity that should be acknowledged. I had the incredible luck to uh, think about the name and uh, offer it at a time that there was a reception for it. And I'm a biologist by background, and that's what biologists do. If there's something there, you name it. But that's actually a human trait. If there's something that we want to learn about, and there's something that we're interested in, it's very difficult to proceed very far if it doesn't have a name. I guess in that way, uh, the credit for planting the seed uh, belongs to me. But as I've said to many people, if the Sealy Sea is going to be something that is valuable and something that is useful, it has to be accepted and promoted by everybody. It uh, involved people in Canada as well as the United States and people in, from the Canadian First Nations and the, the Salish tribes in the state of Washington, uh, all of whom found uh, a excitement about the possibility of it becoming a name. So without that groundswell of uh, support from across the border, uh, the name never would have gotten accepted. Okay, so as you heard, it wasn't until plans got underway to bring oil from the North Slope to the inland waters of Washington State for refining that business leaders, academics, and citizens started to discuss the impact for bringing super tankers uh, into these inland marine waters. And the question they were asking is, what were the risks to marine resources in this shared estuarine environment? What would be the effect of an oil spill on this unique estuary? And there were lots of studies that followed, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and what their studies showed was, yes, this inland water body was different. It was different from the Pacific, and it was different from the freshwater rivers that were draining into it. And um, I'm gonna leave it to the scientists to describe how this mix of fresh water and salty water circulates and how the tidal currents that pull from the bottom float to the top and they create an exchange. And I'm gonna stick to the main point, which is that the, this ebb and flow creates a mix between the surface and the deeper waters so that the inland sea, the Salish Sea, has a salinity that's almost as salty as the Pacific, but there's enough fresh water in from the rivers to create, again, this unique estuarine environment. Um, and it's an ecosystem. Altogether, the surface area of the Salish Sea is about 7,000 square miles, and it encompasses hundreds of islands, even actually thousands, depending on how you define an island. It's home to hundreds of species of fish and birds and marine mammals, and thousands of species of invertebrates. It's also home to eight million people and counting. Okay, so I have situated us in the Salish Sea onto the next part of the title of our grant. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a long title. So situating ourselves in the Salish Sea using experiential learning and um, long title appropriate, I think, since we were awarded the grant in 2020, and I think we can all agree it was a long year. So for this, instead of telling you about, uh, telling you about experiential learner, learning, I'd like you to experience it. And so I'm gonna show you a two and a half, vi excuse me, two and a half minute video from Western and Wacom students' perspectives. This is from the spring 2019 class, so BCE, as I call it, before COVID era. And before um, I cue it up, or before Drew cues it up, I, sh I just want to acknowledge here the wonderful and talented Jeffrey Karoff, who did the production and editing for the video, and also Gail Goulet, who had the foresight, she, she was auditing the class in spring 2019 to record these interviews with students at our final picnic, which we held at Marine Park in Fairhaven.
My favorite part was having the big collaborative team of teachers. They each had something to contribute that was very different. Being an environmental education major, it was inspiring to see their passions and how their passions shine through. Also, I enjoyed having an interdisciplinary class because, you know, having five professors is actually more fun than it sounds. Yeah, it's interesting to have multiple different inputs from different people. I'm from Ohio and the Salish Sea is what drew me to Washington. So getting to be present in this place and explore what this place has to offer and the richness and the diversity of the environment is just stunning. The opportunity I had with uh, place-based learning was very new to me and I really enjoyed that. We were able to learn through experiences and the landscape and that really made the class different than any other class I've ever taken. I think being able to spend half your time with the class outside of school means you are always looking forward to it and that makes you more prepped to learn. I really enjoyed our story map. I'm actually doing my presentation on mine tomorrow for our class. Um, I did marine protected areas and wildlife refuges within the Salish Sea and that was really cool um, to just get to give myself some spatial awareness of where everything is on the US and Canadian side of the border. It's not always about the education that brings people together, but just kind of like having hands-on experiences and understanding that learning in those ways will maybe even benefit you further than being in a classroom. The fact that I have lots of friends in this class and we, uh, we, we also have lots of connection with the instructor. Just seeing everybody learn something new and learn from each other and everybody smiles when they learned something different. I learned so many new types of species and being able to identify them when I'm at the beach, whereas before I'd go to a beach and be looking around and I'd have no idea what anything was. So being able to learn about different species and being able to identify them on my own is really rewarding. Because I was able to piece together a lot of things I'd already learned about. Um, and honestly, it gave me a better picture of learning as a whole and finding a better place for where I belong in the Salish Sea. And just to get to know the place that I've grown up in in such a different way has been a really special thing for me. So I, I think one of the most impactful parts of this class was witnessing how this hands-on field-paced learning leads to civic engagement and stewardship. Uh, teaching this curriculum, especially the, the history of this area, I've been reminded that for well over the century, um, the Salish Sea has been an international crossroads attracting a, a global immigrant community. The story of the diverse people who lived, worked, cared for, and, and also neglected the lands and waters is a narrative that really resonates with the Whatcom Community College student body. Uh, the, the historical diversity um, is reflected actually in our student population today, where non-white students at the community college represent almost twice that of the predominantly white population of Whatcom County. So investigating the, the cultural heritage of our region, be it indigenous, settler, immigrant, U.S., Canadian, it's a, it's a way in for students and faculty to connect their own stories to the Salish Sea. So a, a little, uh, before I, I actually tell you a story, a little history about the collaboration and how the grant came about. So actually not too long after the naming of the Salish Sea, Western Washington established the Salish Sea Institute to raise awareness and protection for the Salish Sea. And um, as part of the, that effort, the Institute created a Salish Sea Studies minor to teach students about the history, ecology, culture, and management complexities of this area. In 2019, Natalie Beloy, who's the Associate Director of the Salish Sea Institute, reached out to faculty at Whatcom Community College to invite us to co-teach a pilot course, Introduction to the Salish Sea, in parallel with Western. Altogether, seven faculty, Anita Harker, Ian Stacy, Katja Kraft, Jennifer Zovar, Natalie Beloy, Marco Hatch, and myself, 
would teach an interdisciplinary course that integrated experiential learning through local and regional field trips and would also include cross-border experiences. So we made that video actually just in time to add it to the application for the National Endowment for the Humanities Grant. And there were three objectives in that grant. The first was to continue to teach the class and continue to develop curriculum for it. The second was to lead education workshops to share the curriculum with other faculty. And then the third was to create a mapping project using geographic information software which would give students the opportunity to build those skills and then display their work to the general public. Um, and I will say the National Endowment for the Humanities apparently liked it because they used it as their model application. So if you're curious, you can actually go to the NEH website and see the Whatcom Community College application. Okay, so on to the next. So we said experiential learning and storytelling. I'll move out of the way there, storytelling. Um, and this is a, a photo of Chairman Timothy Ballou, the second of the Lummi Indian, he's a former chairman, of the Lummi Indian Business Council. And he's telling a, stu a story to our combined class when we took them to Cherry Point, which is just north of Lummi Reservation in Whatcom County. Okay, um, the story. I want to I want to address a central theme here and I'm going to try to highlight that in this storytelling and it's a, a theme of the course and that is to to examine these complex layers of human history in the Salish Sea we need to hear from multiple voices and perspectives we have to see it through many lenses and that's what gives meaning to the content and and I know this on an on an individual level because if I were to ask um, faculty to teach this course on their own, each of us would teach it differently. Um, so our, our experiences, uh, our perspectives, th that circumscribes the way we, we view the material and that comes through obviously in our different identities, our disciplines of training, and our individual relationships to the land and waters of the Salish Sea. So the gift of the class, what I'm getting at here, is this collaboration that we develop with our students and our colleagues and the wider community. So here are the facts. The facts of Cherry Point, and a lot of you know this, is that on May 9th, 2016, the Army Corps of Engineers denied a permit for what was going to be the largest coal port ever proposed in North America. Cherry Point is located in the last bit of undeveloped shoreline in Whatcom County. It's a deep water cove between a smelter and two oil refineries. And the terminal would have brought some of the largest ships into Lummi fishing waters, up to 487 times a, uh, a year to load and unload bulk commodities, principally coal from Wyoming bound for Asian ports. The permit was denied, and it was de denied because um, of the impact on the Lummi's fishing rights enshrined and protected in the Treaty of Point Elliot, signed in 1855. So let me go back here. So what Chairman Ballou said, and this is, this is what he shared with our students, at the time of this signing of the Point Elliott Treaty in 1855, his ancestors had the foresight to protect the most important resource of his people, salmon. Fishing, teaching children to fish, eating salmon, it defines them as a people and they are going to fight to preserve their way of life. The way of life, uh, as he said, of his ancestors and that he they fought for, he fought for, and explicitly included in the treaty. So, in other words, the same treaty that had dispossessed indigenous people of their land was now being used to preserve a fishing and maritime heritage that predates the arrival of Euro-Americans. Euro for me, listening to the story, and, and I share this with my students, here, I hear yet another layer. This was a momentous win for the Salish Sea bioregion. 
the ecology, and the people who live here. Native Americans and the US government, despite a terrible history of mistrust and betrayal, worked in this one instance to solve some of our most difficult global challenges, pollution, resource depletion, and climate change. And they were working on a local, regional, and national level. So my hope is that students hear this story and they can hear hope for the future in complex stories like these. Which brings me to the last part of the title of our grant, Critically Thinking About Place. So um, this is me, I don't know if you can see me in the background there, I'm talking to students about this massive 67-foot peace arch monument completed in 1921 to commemorate the signing of the Treaty of Ghent, ending the War of 1812. And the stated intention inscribed on the top of the monument is to celebrate the long-standing peace between Canada and the United States. Um, the monument's located at the Blaine border. It's one of the few mark, uh, landmarks in the world that's listed on the National Historic Registry of two countries, Canada and the United States. And if you stay within the park, you can actually walk across the 49th parallel, our border with Canada, without a passport or a visa. Recently, there was a, a front page story about families that were able to have COVID reunions, some for the first time since the border closed a year ago. And I only wish I had the photo on the other side of the park, which is where my colleague Natalie Beloy shared with the students the story of the Haida totem pole, which was restored and raised by the Semiamo First Nation in 2018. So together we presented a narrative and we asked our students to think critically about how political lines drawn by Euro-American empires to defend nation states cut across indigenous lands and waters. So the significance of these imposed borders, which have nothing to do with the physical borders of the bioregional watershed. This field trip um, was a tie-in to the final assignment, which required students to write two letters to a leader about a significant issue in the Salish Sea bioregion. Uh, and, and I gotta tell you, probably the most difficult part of this assignment is figuring out who to write the letter to in a trans-border region with multiple jurisdictions on the Canadian and the U.S. side of the border. Um, it's, it, is, it is a challenging assignment, and I think that's what makes it such a powerful assignment. It reveals a lot, the, the doing of it reveals a lot about how power and decision making happens in this region. Okay, so now everything I've shown you up to this point is pre-NEH grant. And I have to tell you, it was a very long wait between 2019, uh, June 2019 when we applied for the grant and January 2020 when we found out we were awarded the grant. We were one month into planning the cross-border field trips for the spring 2020 class, which included a combined Western Whatcom cross-border trip um, to the Gulf Islands, actually to Salt Spring Island, when the college closed, as I said, and we had to go completely virtual. Uh, sad, <laughs> heartbreak, loss, but we, as I mentioned, had a wonderful team of faculty who had taught the intro class in 2019, and they jumped in, all hands on deck, to develop 10 weeks of online modules for the 2020 iteration of the course. So in a very short window of time, we developed the class that I'm gonna show you in a second here, again, in a video. Um, so same thing, instead of, instead of telling you about it, I'm going to show you another video documenting our pivot to the online environment. So. 
I really like the aspect of learning about <laughs> my surroundings because my house is about right there and I didn't know it. So think about this as a scavenger hunt. So there are walks, there are tracing activities, there are readings, there are plants and animal IDs, and there are media activities. I walked to Seidel Creek, I mapped the watershed for it, found out a bunch of species that relied on it. The activity really showed me how different it can be to be walking in a place and admire it for face value versus understanding some of the history and how the creek is connected to everything else around it. I came through Cornwall Park my entire life and I have never known that Little Swalker Creek came through this area. I think where it originated and how it flows through Bellingham is craziest for me. So. It begins right over here with Squalicum Lake. It follows all through this farmland and the outskirts of the city. Because of the lab, I've spent a lot more time just in my neighborhood and backyard um, with my, been studying ferns too. I've really been encouraged to do a lot of independent learning and I've started going around and I've been finding fun little native volunteers. I did a watercolor instead of maybe writing on paper. And um, this phrase, terra nullius, burning up in flames, the word used in like the court of law to justify white colonialists taking over this land from indigenous peoples. The thing that made me think in a different light the most was the Salish Sea map. The physical borders of this place are the complete opposite of the political borders. Huge, huge amounts of ice pushing down on the region. And if you imagine the region sort of like a marshmallow, certain places are a little bit more smooshed down. When you find a source that you think is convincing, look at more carefully at that source. This was at the shore of Lummi Nation Stomach Grounds during the paddle to Lummi. Could you tell us uh, why it's important to have a map that isn't just a Google map of the region? Google Maps um, is not a beautiful cartographic work necessarily. It's very functional and practical. In Lummi language, we learn about the presence of the mountain itself. When we learn it in English, we learn the colonial history. The region's natural beauty is an obvious magnet, but for many immigrants to the Salish Sea, this is foremost a place of economic opportunity. And we see the beginnings of extensive trade networks across the Salish Sea and beyond. Butter clams were highly prized from the Salish Sea and traded up and down the coast and far inland as well. My college career will be focused in this direction, and it gave me a great source to jump off with. The virtual place-based learning to me was liberating. Uh, the freedom of self-study was represented in the individuality all of my peers, you guys, uh, showed and have brought to the table. So thanks for that, and thank you, teachers. Okay, so we were able to make this movie because we asked students to record themselves doing the walks that were part of this Salish Sea game board, um, observing their experiences and their surroundings, I should say, and, and then sharing what they had learned. Um, and in some ways, I would say it was a silver lining. Um, and, and I don't say that lightly, I think because we heard from students that we might not necessarily have heard from in the traditional classroom setting, where you tend to hear only those students who are good at speaking extemporaneously. So you, so you, you kind of hear the same voices. This allowed for new voices to share what they were learning on their own. And it also, um, this, this Sailor Sea Game Board which was we called the lab, uh, incorporated, uh, incorporated rather uh, different ways to express what they were observing in their surroundings. So you know they could do a painting or a poem or an annotated map. Um, the game board, as well as the instructions for for how to teach it virtually, is all going to be accessible 
on the Sailor Sea Curriculum Repository. So um, that is something actually that you can just Google if you want, Sailor Sea Curriculum Repository at Wacom Community College. It's now live um, and it's part of our Digital Commons collection. And this is, again, part of uh, grant funded. And the idea is, so not just to share with faculty the place-based learning techniques, but for them also to develop some of those teaching lessons and activities. Um, this, this repository was designed by Nia Montero, who's a graduate student at the University of British Columbia in the Library Science Program. And so she designed the interface in partnership with our WCC librarian, Rowena McKernan, who has a lot of experience licensing uh, resources for others to use and adapt. So a, a great, again, team collaborative effort here. And the Wacom Community College faculty who are taking um, our workshop right now are continuing to add to this curriculum repository. So stay tuned for that. Okay, so last, um, I'm running out of time here, and so I just want to end with a sneak peek at what's coming. Um, we are working on a story map of the Whatcom Creek watershed. And what I'm going to show you is a story map that my students designed uh, back in 2016. Um, this is my former student Lucas Robinson and Sarah Yates. Um, they, they created uh, this, this story map to show, document shorelines changing by layering historical maps and aerial photographs. And, and it was to show how the bay was dredged and filled. And so I think Drew's gonna uh, pull it up now. Yes, so I can access it, excellent. So this is the, this is the story map that they created. Um, and the story that's, that's being told here uh, is, is actually a, a, a story you've probably heard. Um, so the, the bay was dredged first to build a city, first on the pilings and then on the fill, much of it on the waste from the pulp and timber mills uh, that came to dominate Bellingham's waterfront. And what makes this a, a compelling story um, as, as I mentioned from the start, is we're now in the process of redeveloping this area with a new park, road, light industry, and housing. So you're seeing here, they, they did this great. What, what you're seeing here is, is how they took these shape files and used these original maps, railroad maps, plat maps, and then uh, engineered shorelines and then moved into the aerial photographs to show how this shoreline was, was actually becoming an engineered shoreline. And the familiar story here that, that you've heard is what was happening to waterfronts across America. And namely, that's by the mid 20th century, our waterfront had become our front yard. And I'm just trying to see here if I can get us to, yes. So if we actually, if we go back one slide here, we can see, um, what, what it looked like in the 50s. <laughs> so let's go there. Um, out of sight, out of mind was the mid 20th century attitude towards working waterfronts across the country. And so an obvious example was that the, the holding tanks that are now being used for a salmon hatchery currently located at the mouth of Whatcom Creek used to be the tanks for a sewage treatment plant and it was also the city garbage dump. But then, as we see here, starting in the 1970s, with the growth of the environmental movement, and as many of you know, Bellingham was an epicenter for back to the landers, environmentalism, and, and indigenous activism, but also for sportsmen, boaters, and fishermen. And these groups came together, as you're gonna see here in a minute, in the green, um, to find the best way forward in terms of making this a waterfront that could be both a working waterfront and accessible to the public. 
So these shared values, even among people coming from different political sides, resulted in what you're seeing here, the creation of these parks. And we used green to show uh, Maritime Park, Boulevard Park, uh, Little Squalicum, Zwanich, as well as this ongoing effort to clean up the bay and restore habitat. So, and it goes forward here. So it's been long, it's been messy, it's been complicated, and we're still in it. But on the positive side, the gaze has shifted back to the waterfront. Okay, so um, thank you. I'm gonna go back here, great. Um, and one last thing I wanna show here. Let's see, yes, so um, Events like these, Sea Feast, where my students were able to present the map, highlight the ways in which the waterfront has become our front yard again. And thank you, Deb Granger, for giving my students that opportunity. So the map that we are working on, this is how I will end, um, last five minutes here, will have students telling the story of the Whatcom watershed. And they will be identifying historic photos Give it there. Um, and then so this is the, the, uh, uh, a photo of Whatcom Creek, 1873, and then taking photos of what those sites look like today. They'll be identifying uh, signage, uh, names and words in indigenous languages, and dialects for places that describe Coast and Strait Salish people's human environment relationships. And then here, um, connecting, I think, going back to the storytelling, people to place. And um, I love this photo. It's taken at Squalicum Beach in the 1920s at what was then a, a beach resort with a bathhouse. And it's a wonderful representation of an accessible waterfront being used for recreational purposes. Oh. There it is. Um, but I'm gonna stay on this photo because there's, there's also another story in this photo. Who is in the photo and who is not in the photo? And it's what led my students and I to dig into the Whatcom County census data from 1890 to 2010 to document the foreign-born population. So who is in this photo? Uh, Croatian fishermen, Scandinavian boat builders, Dutch and German immigrant farmers, and who is not in this photo? Native Americans, Chinese, Japanese, East Indians, all of whom labored on the waterfront. So Bellingham's history is also a story of exclusion based on race and ethnicity. And today, just as we are reclaiming our waterfront as our front yard, so too we are reckoning with our past and welcoming in other voices and perspectives. It's a far more complicated story, and why wouldn't it be? The past is messy, just like the present, and yet I would posit, as so many have before me, this is not new, that it's the willingness to engage with that complexity and, and in that process, in that willingness, that we truly um, come to love a people and a place. So, thank you. <laughs>